I started this series <coughs> last month and we have covered eight questions, four in the Telugu service, separate ones, and four in the English service. In fact, last Sunday was a whole set of questions and I gave you that huge homework. It will take you a couple of weeks if you want to understand. <coughs> in the English service, we looked at one question, the first question in the English service. It was a question that God asked, a couple of questions that God asked Cain when he was sad and angry because his offering was not accepted. He said, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And then he goes on to ask, after which he goes and murders his brother Abel. And he asks, where is your brother Abel? And he says, I don't know. That is what we dealt. And then we dealt another question. <coughs> when Sarah was laughing, when she heard <coughs> or overheard the angel telling, that she will bear a child. And the Lord asks, why does Shara laugh? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And after which we dealt another question. This is revision time. I'm used to so much of revision these days. To Elijah, when he saw that great victory on Mount Carmel, he was the only one who stood for the Lord. And there were other prophets who were worshipping Baal. And he says, today it should be decided. Whoever is the true God, let us settle it. You pray to your gods, I will pray to my God. Whoever brings down fire from heaven, he is the true God. And after that great miracle, after God proved that he is the one and only true God. The very next scene is Elijah running for his life. From a spiritual high to a spiritual low. And he comes under this tree and he prays his last prayer. That's what he thought. And I told him, I am glad our God is a God who doesn't answer all prayers, and especially foolish prayers. Which I end up praying many a times. When you are depressed, don't pray. Because you keep asking things you are not supposed to ask. And you decide what you're not supposed to decide. <clears throat> Come to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to pray. Help me pray. <laughs> Handle this situation. <clears throat> and in that circumstance, God asks him this question. What are you doing here? And then last Sunday, in the English service, was a set of just 69 questions. We didn't do all of that. Job chapter 38, 39, 40, 41. In four chapters after, <coughs> generally when you talk of book of Job, people only remember the first two chapters and the last chapter. The first two chapters is when he lost everything and the last chapter is when he gets back everything double fold. So it's nice, beautiful, but there's a lot in between. It's 42 chapters. Three friends come to him and initially they cry along with him for seven days. But afterwards, they start questioning him. And in the process, Job also complains. He doesn't curse God, but he does complain. And he says, you know, why was I ever born, you know? And after all of this, when God shows up, at least I expect him to give him an explanation, right? It was not Job's fault. There was something that happened in heaven which he is not aware of. So I expect God to tell him, tell Job, uh, you know what actually happened? I'll tell you. Because you're not party to it. While you are here, that useless fellow came to me. Who? Satan. <laughs> I'll tell you the full story. This enemy, he comes to me and challenges me. So that's why I permitted him. You pass the test. Wonderful. Instead of giving him that kind of an explanation, God keeps asking him 69 questions. Go home and read. And in the 42nd chapter, after all these questions, Job says, Lord, 
I am like dust. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't want to take pangas with you. Amazing. So today, we took a break from the Old Testament. And in the Telugu service, I took a different set of questions. If you understand Telugu, you surely understand English. That's why you're here. <laughs> All of these messages, the whole entire thing is uploaded in YouTube. As and when the service is over, the entire service is uploaded. I encourage you to go back and listen to the beautiful testimonies that people have been sharing these days, especially about this series and the other messages that God has given. And I just praise God. God has been working in an amazing manner. And I'm sure He will even today. It all happens when you respond to what He says. Otherwise, it's only good for that half an hour, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. But when you go back and start acting and doing what he tells you to do, I'm telling you, this word is powerful. There is no other word that is life, excepting the word of God. Rest all his information. This is transformation, provided we take him at his word. And that calls for faith. Right? Nothing else. That calls for faith. And I can share numerous stories of people who've testified about how God kept operating in their life when they started to act according to His word. Today morning, in the, English, in the Telugu service, we looked at one question that Jesus asked. Actually, two questions in one situation. When He was sleeping in the boat, He was resting. And they were caught up in a storm. It's an amazing message. I encourage you to go back and listen. And to wake him up from the sleep, he wakes up, he calms the storm and the wind, and then he turns to them and he asks, why are you afraid? Do you still don't have faith? And they are astonished. And they say, what manner of man is this? That the wind and the water listen to him. Why are you afraid? I don't want to share that message. I want you to go and listen. Today we'll quickly look at, if you look at the context, 16th chapter, first verse, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They come together. Bible history says that these two people don't get along. <laughs> They're like opposition to the Bible. Both of them <laughs> are part of the church back then. <clears throat> The synagogue, but they are two different parties. Like there are so many parties here also, no? <laughs> A lot of non-Christians ask, what is this Methodist? What is this Baptist? What is this Pentecostal? I said, we all believe in one God. <laughs> but yeah, they don't, they don't come to your church, you don't go to their church. I said, I'll go everywhere, but provided they allow me to come in. Some places <laughs> I can't. Some places they call, but like when untouchable, they'll ask me to stand there and preach. I said, no problem. You want me to stand or sit and preach? It's okay, as long as you allow me to preach. That's, that's the difference. So the Pharisees are Sadducees. But when it came to attacking Jesus, they came together. Go back and read. That is what happens. And that is what is happening in this world as well. When somebody has to attack Christianity, all opposition parties will come together. <laughs> because they don't want the truth to prevail. But he will, praise God, he will. So that is the context. In the, in the first verse of 16th chapter, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and testing him asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. We'll get back to that. So in that context, you know, he speaks to them. We will look at it for a minute later on. And having answered them in verse 4, he turns to his disciples and actually asks some other questions from verse 5 to 12 <coughs> and having said all of that now he wants them to answer the most quest important question that each human being is supposed to answer while we are here as we have breath a lot of us has answered this question and i praise god but probably some of you have not answered this question who is jesus to you I can answer for myself, who is Jesus to me? He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is my God. He is my everything. He is my friend. He is my father. He is my brother. And so on and so forth. Jesus is real to me. 
is absolutely real to me and i am sure he is real to a lot of you who are following him in faith and that is experience experience cannot be explained but if you don't know who he is through peter you will get to know not this peter who is preaching today but peter the disciple who testifies who he is but let us quickly understand how this whole thing evolved in the context of where jesus brought this because the pharisees and the sadducees didn't accept him so for them they wanted another sign so for them jesus was not the messiah they didn't want to while they had immense knowledge from the law to simply say that yes he is the one but the ego came in between their religious system came in between and they didn't want that is why jesus in a sarcastic manner he says in verse 4 of the 16th chapter a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet jonah and he left them and departed what is that i'll simply explain in a, in half a minute what happened to prophet jonah i did a series in the telugu service 2 3 years back run you know jonah ran from god what happened to jonah this is under school story jonah went to tarshish wanted to go to tarshish he was supposed to go to nineve and then he was thrown into the sea because he is asked the people out there he says i am the root cause of this problem and there's a whale that opens and he gets into the belly of that fish he is there for 3 days that symbolically signifies the resurrection of lord jesus Christ. so that is what he says i i don't have to show you any sign because by then jesus already did a lot of miraculous things if you if you read from the first chapter to the 15th chapter or if you look at the life of jesus till this point in time he has already done a number of things number of signs shown that he is the son of god there is no doubt but yet they didn't believe so he said don't come and tell me show me another sign the only sign that you will see is what happened to prophet jonah that means to say my resurrection will be the biggest sign for you people but still you will not believe are you getting it and then he looks at the disciples and he kind of tries to get the answer they tend to, they don't understand was five now when his disciples had come to the other side they had forgotten to take bread then jesus said to them take heed and beware of the leaven of the pharisees and the sadducees because they were the ones who confronted him in the previous verses and they reasoned among themselves saying is it because we have no bread but jesus being aware of it said to them again questions o oh, you of little faith why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the five loaves of 5000 and how many baskets you took up not the seven loaves of the 4000 how many large baskets you took up he was teaching them simple mathematics without calculators how is it that you do not understand that i did not speak to you concerning bread but to beware of the leaven of the pharisees and the sadducees then they understood that he did not tell them to be to he did not tell them to be aware of the leaven of the bread but of the doctrine of the pharisees and the sadducees and then he says it is high time my disciple should answer this question who i am i because the pharisees and the sadducees are not showing me who i am are not accepting me who i am i want this core group and today it is the same case with you and me while the world if you ask the world there are people who will say different things each one has an friends each one has an opinion of christ these days more than any other days are you with me each one go go to facebook and post go and post who do you think jesus is look at the answers that will come good bad ugly people have their own opinions cults have their own opinions you ask jehovah witness they'll give you their opinion about christ you ask mormons they'll give an opinion about christ and you ask somebody else they will give an opinion about christ within the christian community and you ask the world who is jesus you will be scared to death you will hang your head in shame if you just read what their opinion is and they don't shy away 
from sharing their opinion, but what is my opinion about my God? If I am clear about it, praise God. And you can stand and testify wherever you are. So quickly, when Jesus asks this question in verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, first he asked, what are people thinking? Then he comes to who? So first we will look at this quickly with the limited time that we have. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? See, so he's taking an opinion poll. Day after tomorrow, US will know whether it is Trump or <laughs> the entire world, more than the US, other nations are worried. At least India is worried. And Arnav Goswami is not there. India wants to know. So TV channels are silent these days. There is no strong voice. The main man is somewhere I don't know where. <laughs> but opinion. So Jesus is uh, getting, trying to get first-hand information. Right? And they bring up three names quickly while we have very limited time. Why are people thinking that he is probably another version of John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah? Why? There could be a number of points, but I'll quickly tell you one, one thing. John the Baptist was preparing the way of the Lamb of God. Yes, no? Right? And his message was only one thing. Repent, repent because the kingdom of God is near. Yes, no? Go back and read the gospel of Mark and there you will find. And he says, you know, I'm not even worthy to you know, take his sandals, the one who's coming. He was pointing people to Christ. And when Jesus started his preaching, he told the same thing. What? Repent for the kingdom of God is near. So because of that common preaching, people were thinking, or the disciples felt that people were thinking that Jesus is another John the Baptist. Are you getting it? But Jesus cannot be equated to anybody. Not to John the Baptist or Elijah, or Moses, or anybody. Because he is extraordinary. Hallelujah. He was preaching the same. I get it. John the Baptist was pointing others to the Lamb of God, and Jesus said, I am the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. It is not the same. But people had an opinion. That is the reason they, they said. Some are thinking, a reasonable population is thinking, that you are John the Baptist. And there are people out there who, who think differently about Christ. The next one, they said, some Elijah. What is Elijah known for? Elijah is known for his prayer. Predominantly. Why? When he prayed, for three and a half years there was no rain. And when he prayed, heavens opened up. And he was known for God's display of power as well. And if you compare Jesus' life also, prayer is a very, very important part of Jesus. Each day he was going and praying and anything and everything he did before he did, he always prayed. And when the disciples came to him and asked, Lord, teach us how to pray, he taught the pattern of prayer while we actually say out that prayer. Again, tradition. I have broken so many traditions, but this. I don't know when it will happen here. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is not a prayer to be told back in all sincerity. Because he told, when the disciples came to him to ask, Lord, teach us to pray. He didn't give a prayer to utter back. <laughs> he gave a pattern of prayer. A prayer that should start by addressing God the Father. So that's a different subject. That's a doctrine. I don't want to get there. But Jesus is known for his prayer and Jesus is known for his power. So <clears throat> he said, Elijah. But Jesus is much, much higher than Elijah. So they said people are thinking that you are John the Baptist because of his preaching. They said he is Elijah because of his prayer and power, and Jeremiah because of the passion. Because if you look at one verse of um, 
Jeremiah 9th chapter 1st verse Oh that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. So Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He had so much of passion and compassion. And Jesus, if you look at his life, whenever there was anybody with any kind of need, he reached out. So that is the reason he was compared to Jeremiah. So what is this question that Jesus asked that day? It was a perennial question. That means this question comes up time and again in the Bible, back then during Jesus' days, and now as we speak, this question keeps coming back to you and me. It comes back to a lot of people for them to think and reflect and respond, who is Jesus? If not any time, come December, people have the curiosity to know. Christmas is a beautiful time to talk about who Jesus is in a manner that is appropriate. Being sensitive to the faith and feelings of people you can go back and during that festive month, take the opportunity. Don't wait for some organization, somebody to come and do. They are doing what they are doing. But you, because this question people have in their minds and they have their own opinion and answer, by the way. <laughs> during Christmas time, ask your friends, who do you think Jesus is? Start a conversation. And don't get hurt if they say something that disturbs you. You need to have the patience to listen even if they say something inappropriate or harsh. They have their opinion. Freedom of speech. Right to information. Right. Then prayerfully you say what you believe in. This is a perennial question that keeps coming up. And the answer to that question determines somebody's destiny. That is why this is a very important question. The answer to it. Right now the answers are wrong. All the three answers are wrong. That's why Jesus says, forget about the opinion of people. <laughs> At least let me get an opinion of yours. <laughs> I want you guys to tell and then it becomes a personal question. And I want to spend a few minutes here. Verse 15. When he heard in verse 14, So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Let us come straight to the point is what Jesus said. I just want to ask you clear. And today he is asking you and me, straightforward, a personal question about the Savior of this world, the one and only true God. Probably you know him in your head. Do you know him in your heart? I, I am not witness to that. But you and your personal conscience. But who do you say that I am? Take out that you and put your name. What does Peter Samuel say who Jesus is? And before we look at what Simon Peter told, an amazing answer, let us categorize what people are thinking these days. I will talk about four categories. We saw what the Pharisees and the Sadducees felt. We saw what the people here told. And the world that we are living in, a reasonable population of people across the globe, if you Google and see the answer, the answer is that Jesus is a legend. 
you know what a meaning of legend is legend is a historic story but cannot be authenticated i googled the meaning of legend <laughs> because i had some other meaning because of movies and things there was a movie that came no legend or i don't know some people are laughing i didn't see the movie but the but the dictionary meaning of legend is a historic story an epic but that story or the epic cannot be authenticated fully that it is true and if i say jesus is a legend then there is a problem and there are people who are willing to accept that the story of jesus is kya kahani hai boss born to a virgin kali flower gan pis gaya some people understood it is just a beautiful story historic story but there is enough evidence to prove in the bible that he is not a fancy story god taking human form is not a fancy story it is not a historic story or an epic that was just created to fascinate people across generations no there is enough evidence but who is going to show that evidence to people it is you and me through our lives that you say no history is real history is divided into two <laughs> because of the birth death and the resurrection of lord jesus christ but then there are people who still say i can take it more as a historic story like so many other epics that are there in other religions christianity also has an epic beautifully created by all those historians and weaved it so beautifully that it became a convincing story but legends have not transformed people's lives across generations the living god transforms hallelujah amen right another category of people brand him as who is jesus who do you think that i am and the world says that he is the biggest liar <laughs> if you're surprised about this answer you better be surprised but there are there are people who says he told a lot of lies <laughs> bible time and again proves and his very life proves that he not only spoke the truth he was the truth believe it or not i don't have time to go about showing all those scriptures and what he did to disprove the fact that he is not a liar he is the he is the one who witnessed what truth is and that is what he says if people have forgotten because these are passages during good friday time the problem is crucifixion and everything around that is only limited to good friday and the birth of jesus christ shepherds and all of that is december after which gone again come december slowly first carols we start playing in our uh, cars it will not play in november also first week of december sorry if we pray come all ye faithful in in may people will look at us like this like strangers or aliens what happened to you this is may summer long time ago in bethlehem is only in december <laughs> it have been that is the i mean it's for ages that's what tradition has given so we feel lord listening forget about others we feel lord change the tradition <laughs> and play carols during summer time but the point is when he stood before pilot pilot questions him and the answer jesus says you know i have come to be a witness for the truth and pilot asks him back then what is truth beautiful scene truth was standing before pilot because that day pilot could not prove that jesus was guilty of any charge that was put against him it was there was one court case where all the allegations were disproved it was in the case of lord jesus christ in every different council the religious and the and the political every place where jesus has gone the three places before he was crucified everywhere it was proven that's why pilate says i find no guilt <laughs> that is true that is not lies 
what they tried to prove was when they bought false witnesses so many false witnesses saying that he was blaspheming and jesus was silent but people still say some great man of god who wrote a small article long time back during i i also read this during good friday easter time keeping the resurrection in mind his title that fascinated me of the many that i read he wrote the lie that proved the resurrection of lord jesus christ the lie that proved you know what was the lie that floated back then when the when the centurion see have gone to good friday and easter when the soldiers uh, have all fallen down because of the earthquake on day 3 and the stone was rolled away and jesus rose these guys ran for their life and they come and say you know what the body is missing he told he will rise on the third day who believed it is the soldiers and others the disciples came to see the body not the resurrected lord they didn't have faith those guys had faith they remembered and immediately pilot says wow before this news goes out go spread this lie that the disciples have come and stolen that is why he is called a liar there is another group that categorize him back then in jesus days and even now that he was a madman lunatic there were people who told this person is mad he is possessed by the devil and because of the demonic powers he does what he does and says what he says but his life disproves that fact all over again when he spoke to the demons and the demons fled people who were possessed with it then what is the final conclusion He is the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah, Amen. A loud Amen. He is not a liar. He is not a legend. He is not a lunatic. He is the Lord of Lords. And that was told by Simon Peter in chapter in verse sixteen of chapter sixteen of Matthew. he said to them but who do you say that i am simon peter answered and said you are the christ the son of the living god you are the christ the son of the living god and this happened because of couple of things i told in the morning that when the disciples were caught in the storm the storms in our life a storm of suffering a storm of sorrow a storm of sin i spoke of all of that the reason for a storm in somebody's life and when you are facing a storm like situation in your heart we end up doubting god's goodness and god's grace and god's guarantee is what i told because they say lord we are perishing don't you care about us don't you care we are perishing and because of our situation if we say or if we feel that nobody cares about us and in that we include god that means i am saying i doubt his goodness and when i say lord i am perishing that means i have given up that means i am doubting his grace in my life are you getting it the goodness the greatness the guidance of god helps you and me at some point in time to testify you are the lord god hallelujah it has happened in my life i'm sure it happened in your life probably each one of us had an opinion about christ and we were far away but there came a time i'm sure in lot of people who have acknowledged jesus as their savior how did you and i end up giving our lives to the lord it is because god the holy spirit has convicted you and me and that is the goodness and the guidance of god 
He's been pursuing you and me from the time you and I were born in this world. That is what the word of God says and I fully believe because every word here, every letter that is here is truth and nothing else. He has formed you, has given you shape and in numerous ways we're trying to say and one day some of you have responded at different stages of your life and here Peter is responding because of the heavenly insight that he got. That is what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this for you, but for the Father who is in heaven. The answer is, unless I have a heavenly insight, or unless I am touched by God the Holy Spirit, and he is the one who convicts, I think last Sunday or the previous Sunday somewhere I said, it is not the responsibility of you and me who have known the Lord to go and ask people to convert. We are not here to convert people, we are not here to convince people or convict people, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, but we are responsible to convey the good news. Convey it with all conviction out of your experience. And Simon Peter gave this great testimony to this question. Who do you think I am? He says, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you can only tell this. You told what you told because God the Father has touched you. And you and I will speak about Christ and who he is when we have heavenly insight. When we understand who he is through the word. And after we've given our lives to the Lord as God continues to build us, you and I can go about telling a lot more, not because of what I know about him in my head, I know it in my heart. And you go, and share this good news. So people had their opinion. Pharisees and Sadducees had their opinion. But Peter had his opinion. And he gave the greatest witness. Christ is the anointed one. And he is the son of the living God. And today, he wants you and me to answer. Because it's a personal question to you. A providential question. It's not only a perennial question. It is a providential question. Why I'm calling it providential is we are alive for this moment in time to answer. What if you are already dead? If you are not alive for this moment and you didn't have an opportunity to give an answer to this question, you will be destined to hell, unfortunately. And God doesn't want to happen. God doesn't want you to end up there. He wants you to be with him in heaven. And it is providential. Because today that question came to you. It could have gone to so many others, but today it's come to you straight. And if you've never ever responded to this question, I encourage you to do it right now. And say, Lord, yes. I never had the courage to say that you are the Christ of the living God, my Savior. But I want to confess. I want to just ask you to come into my life. And for all those who have done that, what is your role and my role? Because after which I have to stop here, Jesus makes the greatest promise to Peter. And Peter after which fell. <laughs> after that he he disowns him much later. And he cries and weeps. And after the resurrection, he again goes back to fishing in John chapter 21. I mean, he's this Peter of the same story. That's why my dad gave me this name. I lived up to that name. Then and now. <laughs> Unstable fellow, unpredictable. A mess. And finally Jesus sets him. Because, because of this, because of what he told, I'm not going to preach on that. But verse 18, after he gave this answer, also, and, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should, not, that they should know 
tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ because his time has not come till then. So that sometimes he wants us to say, sometimes he'll say stop for now. And when he says stop, we should stop. The problem is when he says stop, we'll go forward. <laughs> and there is a crash in our lives. That's a different theme for us to deal much later. But because of that great testimony, a true testimony, Peter had the privilege to go about being the cornerstone of Christianity in the book of Acts. The early church was built. And today we are the body of Christ. And God wants each one of us to take his name forward. Each one of us, whoever has known him. Provided you know the answer who Jesus is to you. Let us bow our heads in prayer. I am sure a lot of you have know the answer. But maybe you know it just in a theoretical perspective in your head. That he is a true God, he is a living God and things like that. But what is your heart saying today? Can you really witness and say that yes, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of a living God, my Lord. My Lord, my God. That is what Thomas told. Can you say that today? If you have asked him to come into your life, you can say it. But if you have not done that, you cannot. And God is asking you, specifically a personal question to you. Who do you say that I am? Who is he to you? He's just somebody who helps you when you are in, in trouble and problems. Or he's the Lord of your life. The greatest decision that you could take, a choice that you could make is open your heart and ask him to come inside. And your sins will be forgiven. You'll be branded as his child. You'll be heaven bound. And for others, who have accepted him as a savior, where are you today in your relationship with God? Where are you today? Who do you say? How is your life? How is your witness about him? Make a difference for Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord for giving us your word as you always do. In numerous ways, you reveal yourself, O Lord, and you are such an awesome God. Thank you for speaking to us, challenging us, convicting us. Help us, O Master, to live a life that is committed to your calling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.